Well, hello everybody, and welcome to this episode of Savvy Investors at Vectorvest. My name is Susan Hayes Cullerton, and I am the host for this show. And my God, what a lot we have to talk about today. We've had a really interesting week so far this week by virtue of the fact that for a start, the bond market seemed to have changed its mind in the US and it is now deciding that we are looking at a 1% rate cut after the fastest series of uh, interest rate hikes since the 80s in the US. As one of the things that's happened, I have just been checking out here what's been going on in the market today. We can see Lululemon is up by 13% after a major increase in its earnings announcement. And also, I want to take a very deep dive into Carnival. I took a look at the earnings call and particularly the questions asked at the end of the earnings call. And also, I'm going to take a look at Disney also today. I want to take a look at that too. There was an announcement there made on Monday, implemented on Tuesday. The stock is reacting now as well. And also, I want to take a look at Instagram the brand of Instagram and also the earnings results of Meta. Now, it was announced quite a while ago uh, what the earnings, the the most recent earnings calls for Meta, but particularly since a couple of other things have happened since, I wanted to pick up on those as well today. So there is loads and loads and loads to talk about. So first and foremost, before we settle into all of that, like I say, my name is Susan and I have the delightful position of being the host of the show. And the reason that we decided to start Savvy Investors at VectorVest is because I really felt that we could do with having a conversation once a month about what's going on from an earnings point of view with the markets. And that is exactly where we're going to go today. So our first episode of the of the show started in January and it focused on how to read an earnings report. And then last month I had a super interview, which I recommend everybody should check out. I had an interview with Steve Chappell. And Steve Chappell is one of the people at VectorVest I met the very first week I began with the business back in August 2011. It's hard to imagine that it's back that long ago. But uh, Steve and I have shared the stage on numerous occasions, different money shows around the world. Uh, He is also the person behind the Jockey Club. He's the person that also leads the live trading room. And he is somebody that has incredible experience and immense passion for VectorVest. So we had that interview last month. And then this month, I said that I was going to focus on the women of Wall Street, inspired by this book, Ladies of the Ticker. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to pick up on the earnings of all of those companies that I mentioned a little while ago, but give a special shout out to the women. I read this book, uh, it's by George Robb, it's called Ladies of the Ticker, and I ran a specific episode about this of my previous show, Fantastic Female Fridays, a little while ago. And sorry, that was, I think I ran that episode around about a year and a half ago. And it's just really interesting to see the influence of women over the history of the stock market. But believe me, there is plenty of present action that I'm going to be talking to you about today. In particular, for example, when I take you through Carnival, and that is really an interesting, it's a very interesting company. I know I have sold an option on Carnival before. I have bought stock in Carnival before. And so I have, a, I have an understanding of the business. But when I particularly listened to the earnings call and listened to every word of the announcement around the most recent release, the most recent release relative to 2019, the expectations for the next couple of quarters and where they're going beyond, uh, I just think it's all the more interesting and certainly one that I wanted to bring to you today. So I'm going to give a specific shout out to Beth Roberts, who is the Senior Vice President of the Investor Relations. That's what I'm going to do all throughout this episode is to give shout, shout outs to the women of Wall Street indeed. OK, so let's get started, first of all, by starting off the same way that I do every episode and asking you to let us know where are you joining in from? So I can see that Malcolm has got this started for us. Malcolm has joined from Cumbria in the UK. First of all, Malcolm, you're very welcome. And I'm just going to ask everybody else to please do pop uh, your message there into the live chat. Let me know where you're tuning in from. It's always intriguing for me to see what parts of the world people are tuning in from. And of course, what I'm going to be doing then is taking a look into each of your markets along the way. Uh, Susan, oh, Uh, Brilliant to to have you there, Susan, with us. What was the book? And uh, Susan is joining us from Saris 
Sarasota in Florida. Here it is, Susan. It is called Ladies of the Ticker, and it is written by George Robb. Uh, like, pretty, you know, it's a, it's a ver very good, very interesting uh, read indeed. Mike is joining us from Alberta, Canada. You are very welcome indeed, Mike. Eugene is joining us from Calgary in Canada also. Hmm. We have a particular representation today from Canada. I always li like to see that. Um, yes, Mike, you're right, ladies of the ticker. You're correct. Donald is joining us from Las Vegas in Nevada. Been there three times. Great part of the world. Uh, Skyper is joining us from Colorado. Uh, Skyper, actually, I must tell you, I was looking into the FMCG sector yesterday, the fast uh, FM fast moving consumer goods sector yesterday and i was looking at a range of reports coming out particularly from unilever walgreens had their earnings out as well yesterday uh, i was looking at a report from associated british foods and i was looking at one particular documentary about um city market i believe in your your part of the world where they have thirty thousand products and 92 percent of the time those products have to be on the shelf uh, so i just it was a, an interesting uh, an interesting comparison when i looked at the supermarket there in comparison to some of the other ones. Uh, Maria is joining us from Brooklyn, New York. Comfort Amikumo is joining us from McKinney in Texas. And Anu Roop is joining us. Hello, Anu, you are joining us from Toronto. Okay, that continues. The uh, the Canadian trend continues. John is joining us from hot Orlando in Florida. Anytime I've been there, John, it's been the same. Uh, Stephen is joining us from Winchester in Virginia. Uh, I have great friends in, in Virginia and uh, going to see them soon, actually, Stephen. Uh, Donovan is joining us from Minneapolis in Minnesota. I worked with an intern from there one time. Uh, Gustavo is joining us from Toronto. Please keep these coming. It's always great. It's really and truly always, always, always great. Last uh, weekend, the VectorVest team uh, the, in Belgium, we uh, I was over there with them and I lead VectorVest Europe for any of you who isn't aware and we were over exhibiting at the vfb show it was in ghent in belgium so it was super to catch up with a range of people who watch the show as well Stevens is getting me up. virginia's a big state there Stephen. it's a big state uh, and by the way they're coming over to me in ireland but thank you for the kind invite okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to share my screen and i want to first of all take you through the uh, particularly the stocks that I'm going to focus on. So I'm just going to share my screen here. And please do keep telling us where you're joining us from. Lister, you're very welcome indeed from Johannesburg. Okay. Uh, so here you go. These are the stocks that I particularly want to talk to you about today. We have Saint Microelectron. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a stock that I have been watching for a while. Uh, as you can see, it's up quite considerably today, uh, which I'm smiling about because I bought shares in it quite a while ago and I want to explain why. Um, look at that. Look at that for Lululemon, a 13.54% increase so far. And that, by the way, is a lot smaller of an increase relative to what they announced in their earnings. So I do want to take you through that. Carnival, up 3.75% and that is on hot, that is building on the 6% increase yesterday. Again, I want to show you about that, but I particularly want to talk to you about uh, how we might be able to capitalize on the volatility that's in that stock as well. I'm going to walk you through an options transaction on that. And then also Disney. I want to talk, talk to you about Disney, about what's been happening there, uh, about the memo that was released on Monday. And I want to add one more to this, and that is Meta. Okay, so Meta, I'm going to add into the mix here. Okay. And Meta is up today 1.25%. So at the moment, everybody is smiling. And it's really intriguing if you listen to the market commentary at the moment. The, in essence, in between Monday and Tuesday, right? So what are we talking? 36 hours ago, the bond market went to sleep. And when it woke up on Tuesday, it basically had changed its mind. We had the increase. And I was on Glenn's show yesterday, by the way. I was on the, the mid-afternoon market update. Thank you to everybody who was there and uh, and also a particular thank you to Glenn for having me and always to Joey who produces all of the shows and he's ever ready and ever taking care of us and we were talking about the fact that after the the quarter of a percent interest interest rate increase and if I just briefly take you around the world the Bank of England at the moment the interest rates are at four percent they're planning on potentially the, the trajectory as far as four and a half percent by the end of the year and in their projecting also that that would be back down to three and a quarter percent three years three years so that is a very steep incline and then a little petering off down to three and a quarter percent in three years um inflation was at 10.3 percent in the uk in february 
they are projecting that it will be down as far as 4% by the end of the year. And even at that, even at that massive decline in, in inflation, if that happens, that is still, of course, double what the Bank of England is happy to accept. So inflation is the name of the game in the UK. Of, of anywhere in the world, in, of, in anywhere of the developed world, the UK certainly is feeling the effects of inflation more and is, is, you can see that coming across in sentiment, consumer sentiment, all sorts of things. If we look at Europe then, okay, so if you come over here to my, my part of the world and I see Lifestyle Coach says that they would love to visit Ireland, well, you're very welcome. Uh, very welcome indeed to visit Ireland. We do love our tourists. And Lifestyle Coach, you haven't mentioned where you're joining us from, so we'd love to hear that from you too. Uh, so when it comes to here, here's what's going on. So interest rates, again, were, uh, were increased two weeks ago. And it was just interesting, if you will excuse the intentional pun, it was, I found it particularly interesting, the fact that um, Christine Lagarde mentioned that they wanted to increase interest rates because they wanted to show the world that it wasn't afraid of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse. In other words, uh, what they wanted to do was show that they were intent on handling inflation and were not going to be perturbed by what was, maybe not quite then, a banking crisis. Things have moved on from there. People were talking about Deutsche Bank last Friday, for example, in Europe, and, and things have moved on from there. But it's just interesting that the ECB, namely the European Central Bank, said that they were going to increase interest rates to show a sign of confidence in the market, uh, which just has all sorts of things baked into that pie. Now, Lifestyle Coach says you're joining us from the Lone Star. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's Texas Lifestyle Coach. Am I right in that? Uh, based on, and I've been to Texas and it's fabulous state. I do hope that I have that, that one right. So as regards interest rates, in essence, up until Monday, uh, there was a real sense of, okay, interest rate increases, interest rate increases, interest rate increases, rate hikes, rate hikes, rate, hi rate hikes. On Tuesday, then the bond market actually changed its mind and said, hmm... Well, given all of the, all of what's going on, are we going to now see that the banks are going to be restricting their lending? Higher regulation, obviously, right as I sit here live at 13 minutes past four today in Dublin, there is, of course, a big conversation that is happening right now in Capitol Hill. And is that going to have a knock-on effect, which will limit the amount of lending that's going to the economy? If that lim limits the amount of money going into the economy, well, then, is that doing some of the central bank's work? And are we going to see a change in that? where there could indeed be a rate cut. If there is a rate cut, what market or what is that sending? What message is that sending to the market? In fact, if there is a pause in the rates at all, uh, what is that sending to the market? Is it now saying we're into disinflation territory? And of course, the other question is, are we now seeing a higher risk of recession? We saw a lot of that coming through in the tech stocks last year and in their earnings. But look, look at the markets today. Look, look at what I'm showing you right up here. Look, uh, now, ad admittedly, they're the stocks that all of, that I have a reason to put them there uh, and each reason I'm going to talk you through in a moment. But that certainly is the question of the moment is where are rates going to go, particularly in the US? Uh, before I get on to that, I am just going to pop on over here. A lifestyle coach tells me that, yes, you are indeed joining us from Texas. As I say, fabulous place. And Sukraj is joining us from Toronto. Uh, you know, is everyone in Toronto here today? If you are, I am only delighted. I would absolutely love if we can continue growing our audience here at the Savvy Investors at Vectiva Show. So, uh, you know, it's, it's funny that whenever I, I'm, I'm on a show with Glenn, uh, it's funny, I watch him and he says, at the beginning, you know, I'm not going to talk anymore until we get over 200 people. <laughs> I'm always intrigued by when he says that. And then he says, you know, share this with your friends. Tell them to get here now. So I'm going to kindly say, if you would like to, I would love if you would share this episode in your WhatsApp groups or in whatever, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Instagram, etc. And we would love to have more and more people joining us. By the way, if you're watching the show and you are, uh, you're joining us and it's not live, please do feel free to comment in the comment section and we will get back to you as well. And you're every bit as welcome. All right, where I'm going to start off here is, uh, Chris says, let's hit the like button, folks. You're absolutely right, Chris. That it would be wonderful. I'd be delighted if you would do that. Okay, let me start over, over here with Carnival. Okay, I'm going to start. Where is my mouse gone? It is. Is it moving around on my screen over here? Moving on this screen. Yeah, okay. Here we are. All right, so this is the stock that I want to bring you through, first of all. Now, first time I came across Carnival, I remember it well. It was, it was April. Was it April 2020? Yeah, 
it was. It was April 2020. Now, I, I don't need to remind any of you of what that was like. It was April 2020. There was a, we had, I don't think we had any understanding at the time of how much the travel industry was going to be disrupted. But we knew enough at the time to think it was going to be, it was going to be pretty big. So back then, I was looking for some put options where I thought there was good opportunity for out of the money puts. And I was particularly interested to see if I could find something that had a lot of volatility, which was not difficult at the time. And I particularly was looking at this stock from the point of view of the RT, right? So as you can see over here, the RT at the moment is a 0.88. I think the RT back, back then would have been, oh, like, uh, I think it was 0.15 and then when it, went, it went to 0.39 really quickly. So I was watching the RT change, like change very, very significantly indeed. So anyway, I sold a put and I just want to show you the graph here of Carnival, right? So let, let me just show you what I was dealing with at the time. I'm just going to view the chart. Okay, view the, view the full stock chart here. Okay, so let me go back here to, let me go back here to 2020. I need to go back to April 2020. Okay, there we go. Now, the stock was 60 at its height, if I'm correct, I'm pretty sure I am. Uh, in fact, yeah, that was in 2018. No, back here, it was 60. Uh, 22nd of January. Okay, 49.88. It, it, it doesn't, it, it, the, the point still is the same, which is that it fell from basically $50 down to 10. So what I did was I had seen this fall and I had particularly seen this. This is what I was looking at. So I'm just going to zoom right in here. I was intrigued by this because when you see the RT going from basically below freezing, it was way down here and I could see that it was dramatically changing. Then I thought, hmm, this isn't my normal type of stock. Ordinarily, I don't buy stocks with a sell recommendation. Ordinarily, I certainly don't buy stocks where the RT is under one. Ordinarily, I don't sell puts on stocks unless I want to buy. I changed all of those rules because we were in extraordinary times and I felt, hmm, this actually is a good time perhaps to take a bottom fishing approach. So I sold the put and the volatility on it was off the charts. I basically sold the put where I think I got $2 premium on a $12 put and it was barely outside of the money at the time. And I, and that was for, yeah, that was for three months. And it was, if I, if I had had to take on the stock, the stock would have been $9 after that. It was, it was a really lovely volatility sort of play. So I did anyway, I sold the put, it, so it, it, um, it expired worthless and I kept my money and we all lived happily ever after. So, so that was the first time that I was introduced into Carnival. So I took a particular interest in it again this, this week and I'll tell you why, is that I went over here to viewer and then I went to events viewer. I'm gonna click on events viewer. Okay, I'm just gonna tick off these two here. And as you can see over here on the right hand side, Try and increase it there as much as I can. Then what I noticed here is that when I looked at the earnings, scroll down, uh, oh, let me get the earnings for this week, starting on the 27th. Okay. So, Monday, here we go. I saw it appearing up here on my list again. So the earnings were out on Monday the 27th of March and I said, you know what? I must go back and check out how Carnival is doing. What has changed since? So I did, and uh, and I did, and I find that if I now, uh, I don't know, that's the wrong database because I want to show you that too, but I'm going to head on over here. So what I did was that I took a look at uh, Carnival and I really took a particularly good long look at the stock, particularly since the earnings have come out. So just going to bring it back up here to you. So as you can see, it's currently a sell. It's currently, its earnings per share is less than zero. That's why you can see the PE ratio is... Uh, below one and sorry the p ratio is well below one and it's well below zero you can see the rv though the long-term price appreciation potential of this stock is at one dollar or is 1.31 so i think that this is interesting from a long-term point of view carnival certainly seems to be have the long-term price appreciation potential relative safety does it have consistency and predictability of earnings uh no obviously given the fact that it has had an extremely rocky last couple of years. I also want to point out that it is not investment grade debt, right? All of these, for any of you that have been with me before, that have been on a show with me before, you will know this is not the type of stock I normally look for. I normally look for rock steady eddy. I like, uh, I like strong dividend yields. I like, 
I like a whole load of other things than what I'm telling you about today. But I'm particularly interested in Carnival for the reasons that I'm about to explain. So I then went on and I had a look at the earnings call, right? So the earnings call I'm going to bring up to you here. Here we go. This is from Monday. And I listened to it. So again, here we are. I just want to give a shout out here to the women of Wall Street again, and namely Beth Roberts. And I took a look at the main, uh, the main elements in here. But the first thing I want to point out is that everything in it, and I listened to it all, everything that's in it is all about in relative terms to 2019. It's all about 2019 because, of course, 2020, 2021 and 2022 were not normal trading years at all. 160,000 staff. And I'm also interested as well, is that they're at 92 percent? Mm, I get to that. 92 percent occupancy on their ships currently. The, sh the occupancy that they have left are more in cabin. So they have the higher value premium outside. They have been uh, all uh, sold. They have 70 percent occupancy for the year for the year ahead. Uh, they have no 70% for the year ahead. Uh, I'm just going to bring you up the 92%. And see. Occupancy. Okay. Okay. I want to get the. There we go. There we go. Okay. So uh, for our first quarter, the adjusted EBITDA was 382 million, which was 82 million above the midpoint of the December guidance. Uh, and that was driven by two things, 82 million of favorability in both ticket prices as net peer DMs were up, per DMs were up 7.5%, but also higher occupancy of over 91%. And then second, there was 28 million of favorability in adjusted cruise costs without fuel due to the timing of the expenses. And that was partially offset by the $31 million unfavorable net impact from higher fuel prices and currency. So as I was listening to this, I was also interested in what was going to be coming next. And they have 70% occupancy for the full year ahead so far. Right. So I thought that was also pretty interesting. Another thing that really is of interest to me is, is something is one of the key highlights that they talk about. And is it up here at the beginning? No, it's not. OK. And that is how many times they use the word peak. So uh, there are three times that this appears here. They are beyond the peak of their total debt, which was 35 billion. Uh, they are also booking lead times are now back to peak levels. And they also said that the amount of booking that had happened uh, this quarter has broken all of the company's records. And even the weeks book the, the most, I just want to get this again. It was in February, February 2023, Feb, February, February. Spell it. Okay, there we go. They had their best weekly booking volume. Um, this is what happens when you have two screens, by the way, is that you think your mouse is on one, but it's actually being mirrored across. So as you can see here, they said they have achieved their highest ever booking volumes in the company's history. And they actually had their best weekly booking volume for this wave uh, last uh, the last week in February. So we can see that there is a really interesting uh, drive here, but particularly it's comparing back to its peak. So as I was listening to this, the one thing that I kept thinking, though, is that they're nowhere near their stock peak. No, like nowhere near the stock levels they were, the stock price levels they were of 2019. Yeah, you might say, yeah, well, obviously, because I mean, for a start, they're not, uh, they're not even investment grade debt yet. So let's take a look at that. What is their plan as regards investment, investment grade debt? So that is, they're expecting substantial increases in adjusted free cash flow in 2024. They have reached positive uh, uh, cash flow um, in the first quarter of 2023. And I will get that for you as well. I'll just get the exact statistic for you. Uh, and then through durable revenue growth, gross margin improvement to drive down their debt, debt balances back on their path to being investment grade. So they have no intention of issuing more equity. But what they are planning to do is to shift the value then from debt holders to equity holders again, which I think is, is another interesting point. Now, positive free cash flow. Let me just get that one for you. Positive free there we go. They, uh, this is the point that I wanted to make. And I remember just as, as this was read out, they say, I'm smiling when I report that adjusted free cash flow turned positive in the first quarter of 2023. And they expect it to be positive for full, the full year of 2023. So are they on the path to prof profitability? They say so. And they say that that's where they're planning to go. So I just thought it was an interesting time to look at the stock then from a Vectorvest point of view. Let's take a look and see what is going on with the stock. So I'm going to head on over, first of all, to the graph. 
and let's just see what we've got going on there and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through an option okay so I'm going to uh, bring this right down to the last six months Okay, and I'm actually just going to move the graph a little bit over here so that you can see it and see me. Okay, so as you can see here, the stock uh, in, the, in that period of time peaked at $12.19 and we're way off that. So as you can see, since then, it has, uh, it's had a considerable fall. It broke through its, its stop loss, its effective stop loss there on uh, the 10th of March, which was a Friday, if I am correct. And it has fallen since then. And then ever since, uh, particularly the low point here, the stock around about $8.61. And it's now up over a dollar in that time frame. And we can see as well that the RT was down as far as 0.64. It's now up to 0.89. And if I really dug in there, I think it might be, might be interesting uh, to see. Oh, look at what's happened. Just look at what happened. Look at just as what happened right now. Look, Carnival has changed to a hold. As I heard somebody talk uh, earlier on when they were they were discussing this or they, they were discussing um, uh, something on Bloomberg. I was listening to it earlier and then they said, oh, keep talking. You're changing yields. There you go. Just as I have been talking about that is that Carnival has actually come right back up over its, its stop loss. As you can see, the stock has grown quite considerably since I started on this episode 27 minutes ago. So it's I just think it's an interesting one really is an interesting stock to be comparing on now how do i feel about potentially buying the stock i'm not really sure how i feel about about potentially buying the stock and of course nothing that i would ever say now you see dip down again over its stop loss back up again nothing that i would ever say is to ever 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 be taken as advice at all at all it is something for you to always take away and to consider and to think about i'm simply sharing my intent my sentiments on it but for me personally to me, the fact that we have this type of volatility makes this another potential opportunity for a put option. So how would I look at that? So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to right click and I'm going to option, oh, open the options analyzer. Let me just do that now. I'm going to open options analyzer and uh, here we go. I'm going to launch it right here. And let's take a look and see what sort of, uh, see what sort of action we can get. I am going to look at this from a short put point of view and i'm going to analyze the position now before i go on can i just say can i just ask can everybody see my screen okay because i know that it is on a on a small screen i know that, I, that looking at the options analyzer here might be a little bit difficult so please do let me know if there's any issues at all here uh, and i will do my best before i go on can i just check is, is anybody else looking at a stock like that or is anybody else looking at any type of a stock that is currently in that sort of hospitality sector great okay glad to hear that everyone can see that okay um an interesting statistic as well before i get into this actually i just want to give you one more and that this i think is intriguing particularly given all that's been discussed so far around the fed recession uh, bond yields all that sort of thing Here's what I also think is very, very interesting. It's, a, it's an answer to a question that was had towards the end of the call. And that is this one. Look at this. I just think this, this number is, is one that just shows me that mm, it's, it just gives me a different reason to check this out. Uh, you've got to remember, I've been here for a long time and I remember hearing this for the last 20 years in good times and bad. Our business model holds up very well. And the reason why it holds up so well in a recession, if one comes, is because we're an incredible value to land. Anywhere from between 25% to 50% lower than land-based equivalent. And so when people are looking to figure out how do I make my dollar go further, we can provide a better value for money for their vacation. I think a lot of people would consider a cruise brand to be a luxury brand. And if we were to look at Royal Caribbean, and that was another stock I remember, uh, I, I'm trying to remember if I sold a put on it or if I bought it. Again, I think it was towards the end of 2020. And uh, great again, it was a, a lovely, lovely stock uh, to buy at the time because nobody was looking at it at all, and it was so far depressed that it was just ruled out. But I do wonder whether the this figure would I, this this very statistic here. I wonder whether this is actually one that people would be as familiar with as we might be wondering, and um, and therefore perhaps a cruise company is more of a value when i say value i don't mean value as in stock value i mean more recession proof maybe than we might anticipate and if that's the case it makes it an even more interesting idea okay so let me go back over here now what i'm going to do is i'm going to look at i'm going to take a short put and what i'm going to do is i'm going to edit this and what i'm going to do is if i can 
which I can't. I was going to try and scroll in there. What I'm going to do here is that I'm going to look at this for uh, June, perhaps. So if I was going to go out for June, I'm going to take, for example, 10 contracts and the price that I'm going to potentially sell this put at, I would go way, way below $25 anyway. Let's say if I was to go close enough, ah, you know what's wrong? Is that I need to put in the stock <laughs> symbol up here. Okay, and that doesn't seem to be happening. All right, let me take a different approach here. Let me instead right click on the stock and open it, open options analyzer directly from this. I'm going to go bullish or short put. And now this is the way in which I'm telling VectorVest that I want to go directly into CCL. Okay, now we're talking. Right, so I'm going to edit this and I'm going to go for June. And let's say that my strike price based on my, my current price is 933. It might be a little bit difficult to see that because it's in gray, but that's 933. So let's just say that I was going to go for a $10 strike and that was going to be in June and I was to press OK. All right. So let me take a look here and see what I'm getting right now. So the, the premium that I would get for that is, is naturally lower. And the reason than when I than the market opening this morning, the reason for that, of course, is because the stock is up quite considerably. So the current premium is a dollar is is a dollar eleven. Now here is what I would look at here in that. Okay, is that if I was to buy that stock, ten dollars, right? Because that's my strike. And if I take that away, I'm going to buy. I'm going to get a dollar and eleven premium. Is so that's eight eighty nine. 889 is how much I would actually end up buying the stock for. Of course, this does assume that there's no costs and I'm not going to assume anything about your own costs, but I do want you to factor that into the equation. 889 divided by 933, and if I minus one, that means that I would be getting a 4.7% discount on that share price today. Today. Now, if I look at that another way, when was the stock last at 889? When was the stock last at 889? 889. Uh, around about. Okay, would have been a little bit after the 20th of March. So in the past week. So all of the gains that you have seen happen since the earnings release, I would be soaking all of that up. Okay, I would be taking all of that up because I would effectively be buying it for the equivalent of 889. Now, in addition, let me look at another thing. Is that if I was to actually going to put this capital into right if i was actually going to buy that stock and it cost me 889 i have made 111 111 divided by 889 because remember i'm getting one dollar 11 cents and i need 889 of my own money so i would be getting a 12.4 percent return in that period of time if the stock uh was anywhere uh if it if it was let me just move this over here if i was to if the stock was to fall to 889 or it was to be above that uh, at all, I would be making 12.4% in three months, in three months. And this is what attracted me to Carnival in the first time, is that you're looking at a low price stock, very significant premium as, as a result. But in addition here is that by selling a $1.11 premium, then I, can, uh, I would be, be making 12.48% in that short period of time. And in addition, if it was the case that the stock was to fall to 889 of course I would actually have to go on and buy it and I would have to commit that capital but then I would be buying it at I'm going to buy it at $10 the stock wouldn't be worth of course $10 if I had to buy it because then I would if that put was put to me it would have expired in the money on the other hand if okay interesting Jim I'm going to look at that as well on the other hand if the stock was to be anywhere above $10 well then I would have kept my $1.11 and take it from there now very first of all before i go on what do you think of that and and please please tell me please ask me any questions that you would like please feel free to disagree with me whatever you would like go for it you tell me exactly what what you think of that from the point of view of looking at the profitability uh now pro i'm looking at ebitda ebitda's earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization it is a cash flow measure it's not a cash flow measure sorry it is a it's an operationally profitability measure it's not looking at the entire profit and loss that would be a very different story to do that if but instead what i am doing is that i am looking at the path towards where the company is going and if i was to look at that from a long-term play i think it is quite risky i really do the debt at the same time is not an investment grade yet 
So the business fundamentals seem to be there. It's an inherently risky company. So instead of me simply taking uh, an, um, instead of me taking simply, uh, oh, sorry, I don't, I don't use the words that are in my head. So instead of me taking a position, right, that's a more neutral term, in the company, instead what I'm doing is I'm getting paid to take on somebody else's risk in, uh, from the point of view of this and getting rewarded handsomely to do that is basically the way in which I see this. Brian said, I don't like the forecasted EPS for CCL. Okay, Brian, and this is the reason that the stock market is the diverse place that it is, is so that then there is room, of course, for that diversity of thought. And that is completely why, if somebody else wouldn't like the forecasted EPS, and on the other hand, let's say that I might think, mm, even if it was overdone, I'm getting rewarded to take on the risk of that other person and I'm taking it on on that basis. The key thing is, would do I feel CCL could fall below 889? Because if I do, there's no point in doing what I've just, just shown you there. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? Like I say, feel free to agree. Feel free to disagree. Feel free to ask me whatever you want. This is just a way in which to look at taking the information that has been released from the earnings call, thinking about the overall environment, and then also from there thinking about how you might actually want to handle that. Now, JM asks, why not buy a call? Very interesting point. There's a couple of reasons that I personally wouldn't feel very comfortable about buying a call here. Number one, JM, is look at the volatility again. Is that I like like this stock is up 4.93% now. Like the, the, when, I, when I started off this, this conversation with you, it was significantly lower. So the thing is, is that there's a lot of volatility going on with the stock today. Admittedly, it's to the upside. Yesterday was the same. I don't want to pay for that volatility. I want to be paid for that volatility. And that's the reason that I would be taking that particular approach. The second thing is that JM1, in order to buy a call, would have to be sure that the stock, that they're, that they're bullish on it. I'm not sure I'm bullish on Carnival. I'm not sure I am. Uh, like I say, it's got a whole recommendation. It's long-term price appreciation potential is 1.13. Long-term price appreciation potential. If I buy a call, the more time that I pay for, the short, well then, the more expensive it's going to be. But the less time that I pay for, well then the more has to happen in that period of time to make a difference. I don't know how I feel long-term about the stock's ability to rise. It doesn't have to rise to taking what I've just shown you. All, if it just simply stays the same, if the time value just wears off, I would, if, if it was today, my option would expire and I would have to buy the stock. I might close it before that and then do it again because I see the volatility is what's paying here as distinct to necessarily the way in which um, you'd be moving forward, uh, as, as distinct to how, how the stock itself might play out. That's the reason why I personally wouldn't buy a call. But Jim, would you? Would you like to buy a call if it was something like this? Is, is this uh, something that you would do? Do you feel that it could move faster? Do you feel that the time value and the volatility are actually small enough relative to the upside in the stock? Because if you did, then you'd be right. If I was of the mind where I thought Carnival could jump dramatically in the next couple of weeks, then I would be doing more of that rather than what, what I'm talking about here. Okay, so like I say, I'm loving the interaction. So please do, please do keep them coming. Please do keep the questions coming. Please do keep the, the conversation coming. Uh, and, and agreements, disagreements, the whole lot. I'm very, very happy to hear all of those. Okay, I just want to bring you through a couple of other things as well. Uh, number one, I would like to bring you through here is Lululemon. Okay, Lululemon. Okay, way up today, way up. I'm just letting this populate, okay. Here we go here, Lululemon is up 13.12%. Now, all of the fundamentals here look an awful lot better than what I've just been showing you, so I would be taking a different approach here. Value is below the price, as you can see, but relative value, there's significant long-term price appreciation potential. Not as much as Carnival, but certainly uh, it's, it's well above one. Now, the RT is much better, of course. The RT there is at 1.45, and the relative safety is an entirely different story of 1.22. Fundamentally, a, quite a strong, solid stock. The earnings uh, growth rate, let me just scroll over here. Earnings GRT, there you go. The earnings growth rate over here is 22. So it is expected to grow at 22%. And um, now it doesn't generate a dividend. No, it does, doesn't generate a dividend. So let me just bring you through. Uh, let me just bring you through over here. Where are we? There we are. 
I want to just bring you bring you through over here. The, not that. <laughs> Uh, the 2023 guidance after Q4 earnings beat. So uh, the yoga wear, and again, I just want to give a shout out here because it's a lot of the women in the world are buying Lululemon's products. So again, in the name of the today's episode, just want to give a shout out there as well to them. So uh, just want to move on down here. So analysts polled by facts that expected Lululemon, Lululemon earnings to rise 27% to 426 and revenue was seen climbing nearly 27% to 2.7 billion. A same store sales rose 24%, whereas instead the earnings grew actually by 31% to 4.40 a share, and revenue popped 30% to 2.8 billion. So both are slightly accelerated from the prior quarter. So as you can see here, very, very significant growth on both the earnings and also on the revenue side of things. What I find interesting is that the stock price has it has kept pace to around about a third of that. So where the earnings are up 31%, the share price is up about 13%. So about, you know, around about a third, a third of that. Now, gross margins fell. And that is something to bear in mind, of course. We've got to see an awful lot of inflation happening around the world. More so, like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, more so at the beginning in the UK rather than in the US at this current moment in time. But inflation nonetheless so gross margins fell 300 basis points and adjusted gross margin slid 70 basis points. Inventories were up 50%. Now, of course, we can understand why inventories might be up in anticipation of greater future sales because you need to be able to have the product ready when people want to actually buy what you've got. And that is after Q3 inventories left 85% to 7 billion. That does, of course, tie up cash. But on the other hand, what it also does is quite the opposite as well, is that it enables um, the stock that you have to be generating revenue, which of course is profitable as well. So the outlook, it provided first quarter and 23 earnings and revenue guidance and uh, for the full year, which is the one that I'm, we're of course going to be interested in from now on, is Lululemon expects a revenue of $9.3 billion to 9.41, growing 15%, like that's, that's incredible growth. And its forecast is 11.50 to 11.72, for the year, whereas analysts were expecting EPS of 11.37. The EPS in VectorVest for Lululemon is... By the way, don't you have that song? Um, well, you know you make... That's, that is what's in my head now as I'm seeing uh, the, the the symbol up here. I don't know if I put that song into anybody else's head now at the moment, but the earnings per share uh, that we have here is eleven fifty. So that and as I mentioned here, a growth rate of twenty two percent. Right. So that was Lululemon. I felt really important that I bring that up as well. Okay, Disney. Let's talk about Disney next. D I S. Okay. Now, why am I talking about Disney? Right. At the beginning of the year, there was an announcement that there was going to be a 5.5 cost cut, 5.5 billion dollar cost cutting measure implemented at Disney. That was going to include 7,000 job cuts. The start of those have now started. A memo went out on Monday morning to Disney staff pointing out that was going to be the case. Disney has 220,000 staff. So when we see uh, 7,000 staff cuts, that it works out at about 3.7% of the workforce. Let me just be very sure now that my number there is right. Say it again. I'm going to say 7,000 jobs divided by 220,000 staff. Sorry, 3.1% of the workforce. Okay. Uh, some is going to happen now, some is going to happen in April, and then some is going to happen in June. Okay. So that is the way in which Disney has decided that it's going to go. Uh, it's coming from that that has been driven by two places. Number one, it is being driven from the point of view of interest rate increases, the way in which the company is funded. But the other one is this. I want to take you through their PE ratio. Their PE ratio, Disney's PE ratio, as you can see, 23. And 23 would be a PE ratio that we would traditionally consider would probably more a you know value defensive type of stock. Certainly not a growth stock at all. Let, let me just compare this just for a moment to Netflix. All right. Yep. Okay. Now, Netflix is now at 29.82. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you Disney's PE ratio history. Disney's PE ratio history. Okay. 
that is not what I had intended to show you. That is a media graph, which is the industry graph. What I want to do is I want to show you Disney's graph. Yeah, all right. Now let me show you, and I'm gonna to have to move the graph over a little bit here so that you can both see me and see what I want to show you. Now, let me take a look at this, and I'm going to take a look at its PE ratio. Hmm. Now look at what was going on with Disney's PE ratio. I'm going back here to April 2022. Let me go back further because April 2022 is too recent. Yeah, all right. Let's go back here to when it peaked in March 2021. What was going on at this point? Okay, let me go back to March 2020 again. The world, of course, changed because then we were given the direction that we were given and a lot of people said, well, if I'm going to be at home more, I may as well watch the TV more while I'm there and took a subscription to Netflix. And Netflix saw absolutely meteoric growth, as did Zoom, as did a range of other companies along with it. Then over the course of the next couple of years, what happened was Disney actually, particularly Disney Prime, started to outpace Netflix's growth and subscriber numbers. And then suddenly it was, well, actually, maybe this is where the company needs to back. After all, the theme parks weren't going to be able to take people in, in the volumes and certainly at the revenue and certainly, certainly at the earnings that it would have done before based on extra cost measures. So what happened? Well, then Disney became, I suppose, in essence, a growth stock and its PE ratio went up as far as 113. 113. Disney. Disney went as far as 113. Disney's stock peaked at the time at, let me get the, let me get the heights of the stock here. At a hundred, um, hundred and eighty nine dollars. Am I right? No, two hundred and three dollars and two cents. That was in March twenty twenty one. A year, a year exactly after March twenty twenty, which was when the pandemic began. Ever since then, Disney has been falling. Now, is that because of earnings or is it because of the PE ratio? Well, let me tell you the difference here between the two, because the earnings. It was doing the complete opposite when it was reinvesting, obviously in Disney Prime, but also when the theme parks weren't able to take in the revenue that they had before. Ever since then, in fact, really, ever since the stock price actually peaked, we can see that the earnings have been on an upward trajectory. So why has the stock not been? It's because the stock was entirely re-rated. Look at the P ratio here fall. Look at the P ratio fall, fall, fall. Look, during this period of time, we can see the earnings went up. But on the other hand, we can see that it completely, completely started to come down over here. The PE ratio started to come down. So now we are, we are seeing the PE ratio 2308 and we're seeing the earnings per share. Now that also took a dip there at the end of last year. That's when it had a sell recommendation and now it has got a hold recommendation. Why am I telling you about this? Because I think it's interesting to see how the company is building itself and how it is seeking to reinstate the values that it always had. But the other thing that I think is really interesting is it is shutting down its metaverse unit. Why is it shutting down its metaverse unit at the very time at which Meta has and continues to aggressively back the metaverse is because where we're seeing things now moving more and more to is what Glenn and I were talking about yesterday and what Glenn and I talked, talked about back in January and that is chat GPT and AI. AI is now the part where people can feel far more likelihood that there is going to be a, a real drive forward and that is where the metaverse, the, the shine has gone off it. Does that deserve it? I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm really not. I think there's merit in the metaverse. It's still something that I'm watching. It is still something that I actively am engaging in learning more about. It is something that I'm watching very closely to see how workplaces and Microsoft has been the one that I think has particularly taken leadership uh, to, I think it's particularly taken leadership there as regards uh, Microsoft Mesh and just the future of meetings and so on. That's the one that I'm watching. I think Accenture has made very interesting developments in it too. Um, if we were to look at non-listed stocks, I think PwC is developing a really interesting global brand around the metaverse. So I personally, I don't, I think it would be, um, I think if we were to only focus on AI and not look at the metaverse, I think we would be taking our eye off the ball. And then I think when, the, let's say if and when the metaverse was to come right back in vogue again, I think we might be kind of all caught offside and be one of those, one of those. Okay. 
Susan said, at what point percent dial wise is it advisable to take profits and how much of the position should be sold? Susan, I'm very, very happy to talk up to you about that. I just don't know what particularly you're asking that about in the context of our conversation here today. So do you mean that from the point of view of a, an option or a stock? Because they're two different answers. The reason I'm saying that is that if I was selling an option, let's say on Disney, and I'm just going to take take a look at that uh, briefly while I have the time. Um, because you have the time value and because you have an expiry and because of volatility, if you're selling an option with high volatility, if the volatility falls and the time value falls, the time value will have to fall the, because time passes. It's the only thing we're sure of. But so percentile wise, I would be answering that question very differently than if it was a stock. If it was a stock, then I would be looking at that from the point of view of what um, is the reason that you're buying the stock and in what context money management and so on. So if you would just maybe like to give um, me a little bit more context in your question, very happy to talk to you about that. All right. Uh, so if I was to look also at Disney, let's just compare. Let's just compare Disney. You full stock. No, I want to uh, sell. If I was going to sell a put here. Here. If I was going to short the put here, and let's just see what would come up here, then what would I be looking at? Okay. I would let me do the same type of idea. Disney currently is trading at 94.82. I'm going to let's say sell a put. I'm going to say, uh, yeah, let, let's take let's take hundred dollars, give or take. It's about the same percentage of what I should do there for Carnival. I'm going to go for June, June, okay, and I'm going to go with that, right, let's just see, I would have a current premium of 661, right, now let me go, let me walk through the very same process as I did there a while ago, so 94.82, 94.82 minus a current premium of 6.61, right, so it cost me $88.21, in order to actually take this position in Disney, right? So that would be the, that would be what I'd be looking at. And the current premium is 661. So that would be 661, 661 divided by, what did I say, 88, 21. Okay, and if I multiply that by 100, now you can see that I would get 7.49%, significantly lower than Carnival. And that is the point I wanted to make, is that when you are looking at selling the volatility, and the time value and the inherent risk that's built into it, even though we are talking about a different type of company, you can see that there is a very significant um, increase in what you would get for a stock like Carnival relative to Disney. Disney has re-rated itself. It's now re-rated itself as more defensive stock. It's making those, those job cuts we're seeing and uh, the market seems to be re reacting well to that. I'll be interested to watch how this develops over time. This too might be an interesting one at 7.49% over the over that three months. Also, of course, the other thing to bear in mind, though, is that we are dealing with a very different size of a stock. If I was to sell 10 contracts in Disney, I would be looking at, at $100 a share, uh, that would be, uh, that would be $100 a share multiplied by 100 stocks and multiplied by 10, that would be $100,000. If I, on the other hand, I was to do that 10, uh, if it was going to be a ten dollar um, ten dollar strike multiplied by a hundred stocks uh, per contract, and then from there I was also going to take ten of them, that would be a ten thousand uh, dollar ticket price. So just also, of course, that that also just does bear in mind as well, or one should bear in mind. Okay, uh, in the couple of minutes that I have left, I also want to show you this one quite briefly, and the reason that I do is. Right, here we go. You can see up here, it is the t it's, it's the top of my pops. As you can see here, top of the list is, is I, I keep, like I say, I call it Saint, but I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's correct or not. Um, relative safety here, way higher than anything else I've shown you today at 1.43. Uh, way up today, 3.6%. VST is at 1.58. Very, very significantly high as well. Why am I bringing the stock up to you? The reason I am doing that is because, come on over here. To Europe, those of you who want to visit Ireland, and uh, okay, well, I mean that you know, figuratively speaking, you're all very welcome all the time. But 
My point here is that it is actually, it's been the top VST stock in Europe for a while. It's now the top three VST, VST stock in Europe. It did fall yesterday. Remember when you take, um, when you have got a VectorVest subscription. You know what I haven't done yet? Do you know what I haven't done? Joey, can I ask you to help me out with this? What I haven't done yet is that I haven't said, if you're not a VectorVest subscriber and you do want to take a look at any of the graphs that I'm showing you, the stock analysis reports that I'm showing you, the earnings per share and the growth rates and any of the other uh, proprietary indicators that we have, I haven't shown you yet how to take a trial. Joey, would you mind putting the trial link there into the chat, please? And for $9.95, any one of you can try everything out what I'm showing you for 30 days. So please do feel free to go right ahead and check all that out. And then the next time that you join me on Savvy Investors, which is going to be in a month's time, uh, the next time that you join me, you will know all about what to do and where to go and where to find everything that I'm showing you. So I just meant to do that. Now, back to my point, which is that if you aren't aware, uh, VectorVest US is real time, right? You, you can buy <laughs> Lifestyle Coach says, I love VV. Brilliant. Thank you. So VectorVest uh, US is real time. And if you open up the European database, which any VectorVest subscriber can do, or trialer can do, uh, the data is end of day. So what you're seeing here in the case of Saint, Saint, let me just right click on this. Let me get the full stock analysis report here for you. And let's just see. Yeah, ST, Saint. That's what I'm calling it anyway. It's a company in Milan. And as you can see here, it engages in the design, development, manufacture and marketing of components, application specific integrated circuits, full custom devices and semi-custom devices for analog, digital and mixed signal applications. And you can see there of everything else that it does. But it has the strongest combination of value, of safety, and of timing of any stock that I have seen in the European database consistently in recent times. So it's for that reason, that's another one that I have been watching. Uh, I took a, a small, small uh, thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thank you very much for putting that link there into the chat. So I have uh, also just put a, a small proportion of um, my own portfolio into that. And for the recent times, it's been, you know, kind of treading water based on what's happening today. Now, I think I'd be smiling by the end of the day. But that is also one that I wanted to talk to you about. OK, I have 120 seconds left. So if you have any questions, now would be a good time to ask them. And if you don't, I just want to come back here and finish off on one other stock that I wanted to pick up on today. And that is Meta. Okay. Meta yesterday announced that it is going to cut its bonuses uh, for our staff, right? So we can see here what's going on with Meta at the moment. Uh, relative value doesn't really seem to be there. Um, relative safety is at 1.26, uh, 1 as you can see here. So it does have consistency and predictability of financial performance, and it has had a phenomenal year to date in Meta, really and truly phenomenal year to date. Meta's uh, profits though have been on a basis, a gross profit base of around about 80%, whereas a lot of the other tech firms are down. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't even be doing that. They're just down to 65%, which is still massively higher margin, massively higher margin indeed, in comparison to the other uh, to the other tech firms. So it's just interesting that they're continuing to, you know, get into their cost base while still aggressively investing in their capex and as we know they're still backing the metaverse i'm i am on that page where i am interested to see where this is going i'm not discounting it yet but i'm totally on board with the fact that i think ai is revolutionizing so many aspects of how the workplace is changing education is changing marketing is changing um consulting is changing i i have a lot to say on that but today is not the day for that Right, Lifestyle Coach asks me, what do I think is Elf? I think you mean, what do I think of Elf? Let me just add it in here. What do I think of Elf? It's interesting that you asked me that just as we finish on the Women of Wall Street episode, but Elf over here, okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with the, uh, with the stock, but because we're here at VectorVest, we don't need to be. All right, uh, what, yeah, thanks Lifestyle Coach, I thought that. So uh, what do I think here? Right, what I'm seeing here is, uh, got a buy recommendation. Mm, okay, the valuation seems to be significantly lower. Uh, doesn't seem to have a lot of price appreciation potential or consistency and predictability of financial uh, 
um, performance. Now, I think this stock has been rising very significantly if it's got an RT of 1.79. Okay, so overall, that, that's what is, has generated that. Uh, it's got a stop price of 69.23. What is it now? You said 80, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just take a look at some other, other things I want to see there. No, I like this, uh, the consistency and the predictability of the, sorry, the ability to, for the stock to, to resist severe and or lengthy price declines. The CI is always something that I, I really like to look at if I'm looking at the long term. Now, I see the RT is in the stock. I don't see the long term price appreciation potential and I don't see the consistency and predictability of financial performance. So I think where this might be going is more of a short term play rather than a long term one. And if I was looking at the long term, that is more when I would be looking at the CI. Right, excellent growth rate of 33% and the earnings per share of 130. Okay, it's looking 61.77, so it looks like we're got quite a significant growth stock going on there. Have we got, no, no dividend. Yep, definitely a growth stock, all right. And uh, plenty of volume going on there. All right, what I would say here is that in essence, um, yeah, beautiful looking graph. Beautiful looking graph here. I would say that this, if I was going to, um, take a position on this I would be doing so on the I would be doing so on the basis of more technical analysis because the fundamentals don't seem to stack up in the short term uh, the growth rate seems to be there but look at the long term price appreciation potential or using the consistency and predictability of financial performance the industry graph as well seems to be choppy so if it was me I'd be looking at it technically and making a decision on the basis of that rather than long term fundamentals now, U12 play 007. I'm enjoying the analysis and most of all, your beautiful Irish accent. <laughs> that's for free because that's there all the time. You're watching from the MI6HQ. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for telling us uh, where you're, that's a very specific location. Lifestyle courts is what is considered short term, typically days or weeks. If you're somebody who would be more of a trader, um, if you're somebody that looks more at technical analysis, I would be more of the, yeah, the, the days, weeks persuasion rather than months and years. Me personally, I'm more a kind of a months or years type of woman. The stock I've had for the longest ever, I'm going to surprise nobody with this, is an Irish stock, U12 Play 007. I had a CRH for 15 years. I've like lovely company, great dividend, all that sort of thing. That's probably the longest ever holding that I've had. But something like what I showed you at the beginning of the episode with Carnival, where I just had it for a very short period of time, I think I might have only had that option for six weeks where the, most of the value had come out of it anyway. So the, I would not be considered your, your trader. Talk to Glenn, talk to Steve. Those, those guys would be much more of a trader than me. But the fact that we're all different, it's all around. So on that note, I am going to thank you all very much indeed for spending time with me over the past hour where we have looked at all sorts of things like i say i wanted to make sure and uh, and share some insights with you around a lot of things that were happening this week while a by the way by the way i did ask glenn the other day i asked him yesterday i said well glenn you know i'm in dublin for a start i'm live at the moment from dublin i was in i was in belgium last weekend with the vector vest belgium team I'm, I'm fortunate I get to travel around uh, with, with what we do. And I just said, all the same though, Glenn, since I have the show, can I consider myself a woman on Wall Street? And he said, and he put in a few bits before it, but then he says, damn right you can. So today's episode was delivered by a woman on Wall Street, <laughs> even though she's in Dublin. And also what I wanted to talk about were some really, in my opinion, interesting developments that are happening in the economy, in the stock market, specifically stock specific elements but also to bring in some of my own personality around what i do uh, and what i like to look at and by doing that i can differentiate what i like to do with what you like to do so that then we can see how we might both look at things differently um now lifestyle coach says thanks sarah it's susan but that's okay how often do i do the show once a month savvy investors takes place i have another show to uh, lifestyle coach it's called the esg and tech show where i look at trends specifically around that brian says thanks susan very interesting you are super welcome brian and i really appreciate that you said that lifestyle coach said sorry you don't have to <laughs> you don't have to be sorry at all at all at all uh, ah, thanks a million, Boston. Boston is super, right? Boston is just, and Boston sent some really lovely messages into the chat as well when I popped into Glenn's show yesterday uh, to, to say hello. And I really appreciate those, Boston. You're very, very kind. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Boston says, definitely a woman of Wall Street. Thank you, Susan. This webcast was awesome. You're very welcome indeed. Uh, Anu says, thank you, Susan. You're most welcome. And indeed, Boston. I would love if people would hit that like button. On that note, I'm going to go. And the next time that I will see you is going to be next month, where we're going to, again, focus on another episode of Savvy Investors at VectorVest. I'm also going to see you for the ESG and Tech Show. And I will also, in the beginning of May, see you for the VectorVest International User Group Forum. So there's lots of opportunities uh, to connect with me. Please do, of course, keep the comments coming in here if you are watching this afterwards that it's not live. We will, of course, see the comments and respond. Chris said Sloan Lat. Mm, very well played. Sloan Lat means goodbye in Irish. And indeed, Chris, to you and to you all. Sloan Lat, indeed. Thanks, everyone. Bye.